Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, we're going to start off with some introductions of everyone who's joining us on Zoom today. We're so happy to have all of you, and Dr. Lewandowski is going to be our speaker this morning. So if we want to start with the Ely Hospital. Hi, I'm Greg, Greg Tanner. I'll be joining you. Awesome. Michael Bosa, surgery. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you so much. John? Hi, my name is Dawn Venning. I'm calling from uh, Porterville Sequoia Family Medical Center. I'm a physician assistant. Welcome. Thank you for calling in. Alice? Hi, my name is Alice. I am wanting to be a physician. Well, welcome. We're happy wonderful. to have you. Yes. And Troy? Good morning. Uh, Troy Dorgensen, program coordinator here for Project Echo. Awesome. See, he does have the cush seat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to have you. I um, uh, look forward to spending some time with you. Uh, uh, today, uh, uh, today's topic is cognitive behavioral therapy for managing pain. Um, uh, by introduction, I'm uh, a pain management uh, psychologist who I'm actually licensed in Nevada. Uh, but my specialty has been helping people with persistent pain. Been doing that for the last 35 years. Um, and we have a wonderful team here, my colleagues. Uh, on my right is Dr. Dennis Patterson, pain management uh, specialist. Um, he and I have known each other for a number of years, and uh, he has a wonderful practice helping, helping people with pain. Uh, does many interventional uh, techniques, and of course, uh, helps his patients cope and deal with pain. On my left, uh, your right, uh, is Mr. Paul Snyder, uh, alcohol and drug abuse expert and counselor, understands family therapy um, and the dynamics that, uh, that go into that. So uh, we certainly know that people with pain uh, experience the psychosocial problems and, uh, uh, and Paul is an expert in, with uh, addictions and uh, uh, family systems. So we're all here uh, and I thought, you know, I'd like to just reinforce the what I've come to learn is the ECHO model. And the way I'm kind of feeling about it now is that uh, uh, I see it as a, uh, an opportunity for us to uh, hold a, basically a team conference, if you will, on some of the patients that you have. Uh, you've got some uh, folks here who could be part of that team uh, to help you conceptualize uh, your patient, what's going on, ask questions, certainly questions from a medical standpoint with Dr. Patterson and, and pharmacological issues and, and with Paul with the same, same part. And, uh, what I wanted to extend is this model that we're a team conference. Uh, we can be uh, cons cons consultative uh, advisors uh, helping you with, with your cases, which really reinforces the notion that this is interactive. We'd like to make this uh, for you for you. So um, uh, you, you'll be seeing me essentially begging uh, at times to <laughs> get, get uh, input from you or questions because we are here to try to, to, to provide that team conference case management uh, approach uh, rather than a didactic PowerPoint presentation, which uh, I prefer to stay away from uh, and I'm not good at anyways. But um, so um, with that, uh, keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, I, I wanted to start actually with a little bit of a question about uh, last week, uh, or excuse me, the last presentation we did on sleep, and uh, uh, ask if anybody has had a chance to uh, uh, integrate any of those sleep ideas or anything you got out of that sleep medicine uh, presentation. Uh, has anybody had a chance to uh, deal with their patients and, and sleep? I know we have a, it looks I, like a smaller number, yes, yes. I, I did get an opportunity to uh, try to integrate some of that. I'm still waiting for some feedback. Um, sleep is always so difficult with patients, not just with pain management, just patients in general, and just getting to the sleep hygiene. So I did try to institute some of the things, so hopefully I'll have some information for you on the next uh, Zoom okay. session or session yeah. to discuss with you yeah but Don, i did get a lot out of it so thank you well that's wonderful don super thanks and and again that's in the the spirit of this kind of team conference echo approach so that that's fabulous 
Um, and, and you know, my take home on, on that last session, the one message I wanted to share with everybody is to think of, uh, you know, the, the sleep mattress company, I guess, uh, I forget what type the name is. CERTA? CERTA, or they, or they talk about what's your sleep number? Uh, sleep number. Yeah. And, and my, that, I wanted to use that as kind of a mantra or a model when you're working with your people with persistent pain. So, you know, kind of ask yourself, what is this, what do I think this person's sleep number is? And it's not about the firmness of their bed as much as the quality of their sleep and, and what factors may be impacting that sleep. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, let's take a look and see what, what I can share with you about cognitive behavioral therapy and dealing with people with pain. So this is me, um, Michael Lewandowski. If any of you, I did, should have put my phone number out there, but uh, you can contact me through the Echo Clinic or uh, I can certainly give you my phone number uh, at the end of this too. So, um, so I start off with the question of why CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. And I, I kind of wanted to start with the, the notion of, I, I recently saw a, a, an article and I was, I was actually shocked by it, and, and we'll get into this in a second, but it said something like 66% of the people surveyed in a, a pain management a newsletter, a pain management society, had no idea what the concept of pain catastrophizing was. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I was stunned. I, I said, really? So one of the key issues with cognitive behavioral therapy, and we'll start off talking about what that is, is but one of the concepts is catastrophizing. Uh, about pain, and, and I've got some slides on what that is, but uh, I think it's important to to look at this because perhaps many of our colleagues don't really uh, can't wrap their head around the idea that what people think about their pain, their view of of their pain, uh, and some natural tendencies to perhaps start to catastrophize about their pain play a huge role in the maintenance and exacerbation of that condition. So. I guess uh, the first slide was just to say, yeah, yeah this is a, an important topic in your consideration when you're dealing with your, your pain. Uh, I was gonna say the uh, kind of the medical model traditionally for pain, when you think about it, you think about when you ask somebody, what's your, your pain level today on the VAS? Uh -huh. You know, is it a five out of 10, is it? And I guess we, we just assume that it's, you know, what's that patient's, you know, what are they feeling? That's what we're asking them, you know, like where's the pain at? Yeah, yeah. You know, what does it feel like and how intense is it? And we forget that, you know, when a patient gives you a pain number, they probably don't even realize it themselves, but they're also, not only are they describing the pain, but they're also telling you the emotionality part of that pain. Yeah. So a pain number, you know, if, if you really look at the brain, it's wired for two areas of pain. You got the medial tract, which is most, more of the, you know, to the medial cortex of the brain which is more the emotionality part of your pain. And the lateral track is more about, you know, how the patient describes the pain. And when a patient comes up with a pain number, I think subconsciously they're taking both those numbers, adding them together and giving you their total number. Yeah. You know, something really important about that too is once they give you the number, that number reinforces uh, their idea of their pain. Correct. So they're labeling themselves almost in a way. So it's, uh, yeah, I'm at a seven. So yeah, I'm a seven. Yeah. And so breaking it back or bringing it back, there's a lot of different factors that go into that. Like it's the emotional pain yeah. and physical pain are both very but real. It, I think what you're saying is it may tend to reinforce the the uh, sensational part of it or the sensation of pain yeah. rather than the maybe the experience and the thoughts they have about having those sensations. Correct. So it reinforces that that biological medical sensation. Yeah. yeah, and I've seen, you know, cases where you treat patients' pain, and they'll, you know, they'll come in and tell you that, like, some intervention you did, and they'll say, Doc, I feel great. Yeah. But they're, you know, I'll look at their pain number, and it'll have gone from, like, a 7 to, like, a 6, you know, but they yeah. tell me they're 90% better. Yeah. But when you really dig in on it, they'll tell you, well, Doc, I, you know, I still just can't get off the couch, and I, you know, I'm, you know, because yeah. you're not, that intervention doesn't address the emotionality part of the pain. It's yeah. only addressing the physical part of the pain. Yeah. Um, and so you can't treat one without the other. Yeah. And we're retraining the brain, which goes yeah. right back to what you're saying. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, so um, thank you. A any comments out there? Any thoughts about what we said so far? So, okay. Um, if you have any, feel free to just blurt them out. So I love
love this. I've got a couple of quotes I wanted to share with you, which really does reinforce the notion of how important our thinking and cognitions are in dealing with a persistent pain experience. So Epictetus, uh, the famous Greek Stoic philosopher who I read frequently, um, said that people are not disturbed by events, but rather the view that they take of them. So we have the pain sensation, and that is very important, and we need to deal with that, and we need to take a look at how the person's interpreting those sensations. Uh, Shakespeare, I love this line. This isn't Hamlet. I'm going to try to impress you with my literary background. <laughs> Hamlet said, things are neither good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And, and again, emphasizing the, the importance of it's the view, it's the interpretation of the experience that's important. And, uh, and that really kind of is a centerpiece. I, I, I have to say that is probably sums it up for me right yeah, now. I've yeah. never thought about that. I, <laughs> I, I, I have, you know, patients that will come and see me, and the ones that are more positive, like, Doc, we're going to yeah. really work together and get rid of this, are ones that, like, motivate me. But the patients that, you know, I'm, I'm standing in the hallway, and I've got my medical assistant walking them down to the room, and... Uh, you know, I see them and I'm like, hey, yeah, yeah. how are you? Yeah. You know, like trying to be positive influence on them. And they walk by and they're like, miserable. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm like, can't you just fake it for the, for the, for the five second interaction when I get in the room and we talk yeah. about how miserable you are? Yeah. But no, you yeah. got you to gotta say how miserable you are in front of everybody. And yeah. I think you're right. There's a mental component to, to it. Like if people want to be miserable, they're going to be miserable. And, and, and I think what leads, what goes one layer deeper than that is, is it not their responsibility on how, what perspective they take? Yeah, correct. So they, from an empowering standpoint, play a huge role in that experience. Yeah. It's their thinking. It's, it's their yeah. interpretation. Of in the middle of my office, I just wish they'd fake yeah. it for that <laughs> interaction. And then when Which we're in the room, we can talk about like, how, how miserable it is. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So these two, uh, of course, go back many, many years. Uh, you know, so the first cognitive behavioral ther therapists, I think, were, uh, were Shakespeare and uh, Epictetus. Uh, more currently, we have uh, uh, Gatchel, who is a famous pain researcher. George Gatchel says, that, you know, there is usually a strong connection between how you think, how you feel. It may not be what happens to you that causes you to become anxious or tense, but what you tell yourself about what happens. And I think. You know, I hope these three quotes help set the stage here for, uh, for me to kind of uh, introduce this concept that what people think, their interpretation of events, cognitions, and cognitive behavioral therapy needs to play a huge role uh, as a partner in this biopsychosocial model uh, in working with the people that come to your office uh, who have chronic pain. Okay, well... Not only that, but the American Medical Association, in my opinion, agrees with the idea that uh, the cognitions are important. Uh, this is pretty standard stuff. I think this was back in 1995. They, they kind of talked about the treatment of chronic pain. And the basic idea here is that, you know, it's not a strict uh, laboratory uh, experience. It's not a number, like Paul was saying, you know, on a 0 to 10 scale, what's the sensation of pain? Um, we have to look at it more broadly and incorporate what the person thinks about their condition. I think that's, that's the point there, and I applaud the AMA for, for in a sense, you know, being part of that. So, um, what do we know? Well, over the last 20 years, probably even more so, a lot of research has been studying pain and the role that thoughts play, that uh, ideas, that interpretation plays in, in the pain experience. And we'll talk a little more about what catastrophizing is and, and also fear avoidance and behaviors and thoughts and the roles that those play in, as I said, the maintenance and exacerbation of pain. So, um, uh, so let me do this. Uh, input, thoughts. Is this making, making any sense? Any people disagree? How many agree and say, yep, this is something I need to look at? I think we've got, we've got thumbs up, You're excellent. Okay, good. Now, I guess, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, how do you go about doing that? And do you do that? And, and what do you do if you're a physician? And, uh, and help me here, but uh, you've got maybe eight minutes with the person before you sit. How do you do that? And, uh, you know, that's, that's a very interesting question. Yeah, yeah I, I think from our standpoint, it's, it's actually taking advantage of metrics or your MSQS yeah. and, and having a patient fill it out. And, 
and and then having the chance when the patient's not around, you know, between visits to review, mm -hmm. you know, how they assess yeah. assess their yeah. situation, and then what 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 it allows me to do instead of really delving into or talking to them about it, I can see if I need to make a referral to somebody yep. for the cognitive part to help their pain. Um, and then I just have a, a canned, you know, 30 second to one minute talk about, hey, you know, last time, you know, you, you filled out this questionnaire. Yeah. I appreciate your honesty in it. I just want to go over, um, uh, you know, some things with it with you. And usually I start out with their, 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 their strong points. Yeah, like, their strengths. Yeah, their yeah. strengths, like, you know, yeah. And so I want to encourage them to say, hey, these are really good. I'm glad you have these to fall on. But hey, I'm a little concerned mm -hmm. about this. And then I kind of say, hey, your pain seems to be causing you to be angry. You're, you're frustrated. Good. And you have some anxiety and depression. And I'm like, look, I can, I can help you from a medical standpoint um, with the pain. But from a cognitive, I need to help you understand how to help, help that. So I got to make a, an appropriate referral to somebody to, to okay. assess and see what they can do. And I think by taking, softening that tone and you know, it, it seems to, to make a difference where in the past I'd go in and be like, Oh, you're high risk. You need to go see somebody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and then I think the patient's offended. So you utilize the assessment to kind of hear their story and tell them back Correct. what they're saying to you. And that maybe helps with the bond. Correct. I also heard what you say, which I think is very important. I want to emphasize is the interdisciplinary team approach that we need to utilize with persistent pain patients. That Correct. you would make a referral to someone in, in, in behavioral medicine or psychology, Correct. or you'd make a referral to you know yeah addiction specialists. Yeah, yeah. It, it it is a uh, persistent pain is a team sport, not an individual sport. Yeah. <laughs> it took especially somebody has an addiction. Yeah, issue or they have uh, some kind of dependency issue, whether it's physiological or psychological. It took time to grow that condition. It took time to walk into the forest. It's going to take some time to walk out. Uh, the idea there is if it's really like mental health, deep stuff. Dr. Lewandowski will spend an hour, two hours with people. So will I. My first session with a person is doing a two hour biopsychosocial evaluation, trying to get the idea of where they are. And when you're doing that, there's a lot of things that go into play. Their memory, are they defensive? Are, um, what do they want to, uh, to relay to you? Do they really have issues with their family, with their environment? Where's their readiness to change? What are their medical conditions? What are their emotional conditions? All of these things are a huge universe that this person has been experiencing and all need to be de dealt with. So that's how we launch. And then I can see them one to three times a week with groups, with pain specialists, with mental health specialists, with clinical psychologists. That team approach is essential to hitting all of those different areas. And then they're not forever. You can make this temporary, but you have to define what does success look like and what's our exit strategy. So if you're looking at addiction, okay, well, the idea is we're going to stop using these substances or whatever the substance is. But then how about behaviors? How about different things that are going to be popping up in your life? So we define success, but if you're looking at addiction specialists or addiction treatment, it's just getting the stuff out of the system. That's called detox. <laughs> that takes three to 10 days, maybe. The rest of the stuff is dealing with the mental health and the emotional stuff that has been covered up or is even retrained the brain to be more sensitized to anything that they are actually feeling or they perceive that they could be feeling. So there's a big uh, area there that hasn't really even been addressed, and it does take that team approach of specialists. That also takes the weight off of the primary care physician, the surgeon, the, the, uh, the doctor, because then by having the team approach, they're avoiding an awful lot of liability by trying to pack in 10 pounds of therapy in a seven minute bag. 
Yep. So it makes a lot of sense legally, uh, patient care-wise, uh, ethically. So yeah, I think what what Paul's emphasizing is the the importance of having an interdisciplinary uh, panel. And you know, we recognize that if you're out in Austin, Nevada, or Elko, or Ely, you may not have access to some of these services. Right. All the more reason to perhaps think about utilizing the team that's sitting in front of you right now. Uh, to offer some some kind of guidance on an individual case by case basis. So I, I want to reinforce the idea that if this really can become a uh, the Echo Clinic is intended to make this personal for you. So please utilize us. Okay, so uh, a couple things. So I want to I'm going to try to talk about what is and what isn't cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, talk a little bit about some treatment strategies. Maybe a few things you could actually use uh, in your uh, limited time with your patient. Uh, some of the research uh, that talk kind of globally about what I would consider and, and others have written about called the three waves of philosophies of cognitive behavioral therapy, just to give you a kind of a historical background and how we got to where we are today and what seems to work today and what worked in the past or didn't work. Um, and then maybe some strategies for implementing these, uh, this information. Uh, so uh, this little comic says it, it hasn't been easy going through life with a name like mine, Dr. Feelgood. Uh, it hasn't exactly been a picnic for me either, Mr. Smarty Pants. So, you know, the idea that words do matter. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to take a look at what words mean and what people interpret those words as, uh, as meaning. So, what CBT is not? Uh, I, I like to use humor, so jokingly I said it's not ECT. Um, it's not shocking someone <laughs> into believing what you want. But, but CBT is also not a Freudian psychoanalysis, uh, which aims at trying to get at some subconscious uh, determinants of behavior. It's also cognitive behavioral therapy isn't really patient-centered humanistic therapy, um, the, the Rogerian schools, if you will. Um, it, it takes a more active role, and it's a more of an educational structural training uh, approach. Um, and I think uh, that tends to, to work pretty well with folks with persistent pain. So that's what CBT is not. So, you know, basically then what is? Or what does it try to do? Why does it help with people with pain? Um, well, essentially it's taking a look at uh, that one of the first quotes, you know, it's not the things that happen to us, it's important, it's the view we take. Uh, I think the efforts of cognitive behavioral therapy and therapists is to help people look at how they view their pain and basically say, hey, what's working? What is it in the way you're viewing this? Is there a chance you could look at it differently? Is there a chance you could maybe change the way you perceive your pain? Um, not with the idea that we're just trying to convince them they don't have pain because they do, but it may be valuable to put that mirror up and take a look at any patterns they have developed in thinking about the world and how they interpret events. And I would say, based on my experience in my own life, you know, we get into patterns. We tend to repeat the way we look at things over and over again. Yep. And sometimes they're not working very well, but change is not easy. Um, but I think that it's important to just take a look at that. And essentially, we're inviting people to change the way they view their pain. Uh, and their thoughts, and then the emotions that occur with that. Um, and the goal, of course, is to improve quality of life and function. Uh, that's kind of the guiding principles of, I think, all pain management. And I've used that, since I think you gave this talk previously, um, you know, when the patient asked me, oh, you're gonna send me to somebody else, what are they gonna do, you know, or, you know, kind of sarcastically. I, I've actually said this exact same thing. Oh, yeah, I said, hey, is that you've had an experience in your life that has caused you, um, uh, you know, pain mm -hmm. that you've been dealing with for a very long time. Unfortunately, that pain leads to you to feel or have certain emotions, which then leads to you behaving or, you know, interfacing with the, your, world. Your, the world in a certain way. And so if we can change maybe how you are emotionally attached to this pain or how you emotionally feel about it, we may be able to change your your behavior in your interactions with the world, yeah. um, which can make you know life more enjoyable, yeah. and I think a lot of patients understand that. Yeah, they do, and and I've even presented it to people to say, well, is what you're currently doing working? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't you know, be here. Yeah, you wouldn't be here if it was working. 
So you know, you're trying to get that motivation for change and trying to kind of engage them and looking at yeah. looking at doing their pain differently. Correct, because you can't change the event. No, the event has happened. The event has happened. Now yeah. you just got to change, uh, you know, how you proceed it and right. how you move forward. Yeah, and the other side too, the trigger hasn't changed and it's not going to. Yeah. So the liquor store's there, right? Yeah. And you got the guy with the third or fourth DUI, okay? Yeah. So he drives by the liquor store and the first thought is, you know, there's a lot of good bias in that liquor store. <laughs> so we have to change that thought to, yeah, there's a lot of good buys. Goodbye freedom, yeah. goodbye money, <laughs> goodbye relationships, yeah. goodbye life as I know it. Once that happens, it changes, just uh, by saying that, it changes the way the person feels. That empowers them just in that moment by that thought process to go buy that liquor store. So we're responsible yeah. for our second thought and first action, and when we're thinking about our thoughts, being able to control what we're thinking and remapping yeah. the brain. Yeah. You know, and I, I think of uh, the, the medical and rehab model of looking at pain. You know, that external versus internal. But to use your metaphor, um, to me, the example of a person with pain uh, externally in the, that situation would say, well, what, what should happen is we should close all the liquor stores. They should, you know, make them illegal so that they're not out there, right. you know, which is an external focus, rather than, you know, I need to take a look at maybe not driving by them, something I have more control yeah. over. Exactly. And I think that's reflected in pain management too, where yeah. we want to go see a doctor where they're going to take my pain away and I can passively just sit back and relax and wait for it to happen. Exactly right. I, I saw a patient the other day and she'd been coming for two months and she's like, I've been coming here for two months and you've done nothing to help me. Yeah. And I just turned around on her. I said, I said, what have you done to help yourself in the past two months? Yeah. I've given you a referral to PT. You haven't yeah. gone. I've given you this. You haven't done it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, so help me help you. That's right. Like this is right. this is a team and, effort. And I think got to make an effort. And that's part of the shift that you hopefully can help initiate her making that yeah. change in terms of looking at, wait a minute, maybe how I view my pain needs to change. Yeah. Well, yeah, the thought of function over pain relief. Mm -hmm. You break your arm, it's going to hurt. Yeah. If you're taking opioids two years later, yeah. there's probably a problem. There's yeah. probably a problem yeah. <laughs> there. Yeah, so is the pain relief or the masking of the pain, taking a pill takes no effort. Yeah. But that function is discomfort. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to expose yourself to therapy, yeah. which is going into a place that is unknown and takes effort. Yeah. Yeah. And so the system is set up to keep that pill going, but now, and it's beneficial until it's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, excellent. Oh, go ahead. I'm going to start Okay, yeah, Dr. Patterson needs to take off. Sorry, guys. Thank I, you for I, I had a patient admitted overnight. I got to go to the hospital and do a kyphoplasty on him, and they only had a OR time at 9 o'clock. So my apologies, but I'll see you guys all in two weeks. Thank you for your time. Right. Wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Three hours of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, some of these slides I'm going to kind of go over quickly, but uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is a psychosocial intervention. Uh, there's a lot of good uh, research that shows that it works, that it uh, is an important uh, uh, component of pain management. And, you know, I, it, it's kind of based on the, it was originally developed to treat depression uh, and emotional issues rather than uh, uh, chronic pain per se. And I, and I like this, uh, the, the idea, the, the last point there, that our thinking gets sticky. We sometimes get stuck in the way we view the world and the way we respond and the way we try to solve problems. And I guess the word no blame there I put in there is the notion that we as part of the treatment team probably need to resist the temptation to blame them for the being stuck and, and, that, and versus maybe we're there to more help them with keys to get unstuck. Yeah. And maybe some of the strategies that cognitive behavioral therapy uh, has developed um, is a way to help them get unstuck in terms of their situation that they can. So uh, the challenge of pain is to deal with negative thoughts over time and beliefs about pain and pain behaviors developed, and they can become very resistant to change. And if you think about you know, pain, um, we're not, since we have so many people with persistent pain, what we're currently doing maybe isn't working. And people get really stuck in their thoughts and behaviors. 
So ideas of thoughts or, or examples. When you hear your patient say, my pain is killing me, you can see the emotional component of that. Um, you know, it's never gonna end, uh, which again, some of these reflect the catastrophic thinking about the pain. I'm worthless to my family, so there's now, now self-esteem issues tied here. Or I'm labeled, I, I don't see myself as being capable and competent, I'm disabled. And you know, there's nothing I can do for myself, that sense of uh, passivity and, and giving up and, and reinforce the notion of external strategy. You've got to do something for me because there's nothing I can do. So this is, these are some examples of thoughts that people with pain uh, develop. Now, thoughts are accompanied by behaviors. What do we do? Uh, and what are we doing? So if we're staying in bed all day long, if we're sleeping during the day, you can see we're creating sleep hygiene problems. We're, we're, deep, we're beginning the deconditioning uh, uh, process. Uh, we begin to walk and limp and hold our head and frown. Uh, we stay away from friends. Friends then interact with your frowning and either reinforce those pain behaviors by sure. saying, how can I help you? Or friends often say, yeah, I gotta go. I don't wanna be around you. So now there's a punishing component to your behaviors. And I put this picture here of uh, Dr. Wilbert Fordyce, who is a, uh, he has passed away, but he was up at the University of Seattle. Um, and he's kind of, uh, in my field in psychology, the grandfather of, uh, of uh, uh, pain behaviors, the concept of pain behaviors, and looking at pain behaviors, treating pain behaviors as a one step in the process of helping people cope with their pain better. He, he was a brilliant man. Um, so this slide is intended to talk about the points that we would want to make uh, in the course of our work with someone if we were doing cognitive behavioral therapy. You know, the idea that pain includes these things, stuff we've just talked about. There it is. Uh, you know, the fact that it has a biopsychosocial implication. Um, the fact that, uh, you know, these thoughts impact our, our feelings and it can lead to withdrawal and avoidance behaviors. Uh, and that there's traps in our thinking when, when we get stuck. So these are some of the uh, critical kind of educational points. I, I talked earlier about the medical versus rehab views. Uh, the, I think this slide, I just wanted to kind of point out that maybe my challenge, our challenge is to help people uh, with persistent pain. Now, this is not talking about acute pain problems, but with chronic pain, helping them move to a more self-management rehab view of what I can do to help me deal with, uh, the, help themselves deal with their pain problem uh, in terms of their thinking and their thought processes. So uh, I offer this model that people move back and forth between the medical and rehab focus that's normal, they're not crazy, uh, and I don't mean to demonize people that may be on just the medical side, but I would raise the question, if you've had pain for five years and you're still looking for a medical cure, that probably isn't working very well. Uh, we need to look at what we can do or you can do for yourself. So here's, what, uh, here's the basic model, and Dr. Patterson was talking to it before, you have an event, events happen. We can't change them, can't change a snowstorm, okay? We develop a thought about that. I don't deserve this. This is not right. This is not fair. We then have a feeling or an emotion. In this case, my example, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. And then behaviors could reflect that through high blood pressure, getting a headache, or sticking our fist out the window at the smell. Okay. So this is the basic model. And where we would intervene would be in the thought section of that process. We can't change events but we may have an influence over how we perceive them, right. and that could change our feeling and ultimately lead to some behavior change. So we call it the cognitive triad or triangle. Uh, all these things, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors all interact. Uh, I just wanted to give you an example of kind of where we would go with someone. So Phil on the left is someone who's kind of stuck still. Um, in this case, 32-year-old Caucasian male, He's experiencing burning and numbing, uh, low back pain, travels down to his legs. He's feeling frustrated, sad. What is he saying to himself? This pain is horrible, it's unbearable, I can't go on like this, okay? Well, he imagines the pain takes over his whole body, uh, he's beginning to catastrophize, and guess what happens? His pain worsens, uh, he's become very absorbed in his pain, that's all he wants to focus on is getting away from it, and he's frustrated, depressed, and sad. There you go. Perfect. 
You know, uh, I was reading a study and it showed that uh, 40% of people with depression have low back pain. Yeah. Mm. So bringing those two together, just being aware of that is comes right into this uh, scenario. It's a perfect fit. So Sally on the right here would be a person who takes a different approach to her pain. Now, it, deliberately, we have the same experiences of burning, numbing pain, low back down to her legs. Um, she feels irritated, thinks, you know, here it comes again. Oh, geez, here we go. I know it's going to hurt. What the heck can I do? So you see right away a difference in her focus is instead of a passive giving up, more of a, okay, what can I be responsible for? More of a rehab kind of a look at it. And what does she say? Hey, I need to catch my breath and focus on something else to distract myself. I need to practice breathing. I need to take, you know, steps that to manage it. Uh, keyword versus fix it and cure it. Yeah. Uh, cognitive error there. And, you know, and I have to focus on relaxing my body. It's, you know, maybe, you know, and it's not time to take my next pain pill. I have to wait. So two different approaches, same pain. And, of course, what we're aiming to get at would be helping people move to what Sally's experience has been. So uh, cognitive error. Uh, it's a negative. Oh, we have a question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I noticed the phenomenon or of a lot of my younger patients having that first gentleman situation where they, it's just overwhelming and their x-rays are pretty much not really yeah. anything. And then I have an elderly patient who has this attitude of, let me just get through this. And her or his x-rays are like, a catastrophe is horrible. It's, and yeah. How do we get, I, I know it's what you're talking about right now, but I'm seeing these younger people early on. So how do I intervene now before they have to go to CBT and, uh, or. Yeah. Great question. Thought processing. Excellent, excellent question. I would say that your level of intervention is critical because you're there at that early moment. And one thought, one suggestion may be to gently plant some seeds of words that may help them begin to look at uh, a change. Um, if, if I would reinforce or encourage you to use words like, well, you know, we're, we're here to take a look at how we can help you manage your pain, how to teach you how to cope with it. Give them these words, which kind of uh, negates the idea that there's a fix and a cure, and if we just run this test, it'll all go away. I will take it away and, and reinforce the model that what they do plays a critical role in the development of chronic pain. And we don't want that to happen. So here's some things that I would encourage you to, to do and be proactive. Try practicing some breathing uh, and do all the other medical things that we, we know works, which is keep moving. Maybe walk a small distance, monitor your diet, don't eat a lot of sugars. But the, the basic idea here, I think, would be to reinforce that, hey, they play a, a pretty big role in how stuck they get. And you would encourage them to look at their thinking and that their thinking plays a role. Perhaps, you know, uh, cite Hamlet and Shakespeare. Things are neither good or bad. It's, you know, your thinking that makes it so. Kind of reinforcing the model that, hey, your thoughts do play a pretty big role here. So let's, maybe we could take a look at that. Uh, do you tend to think negatively a lot? Uh, Early on, that would be very helpful. And something I think that could have an impact um, where you are face to face with that person early on in the pain. And I ha do have a couple suggestions coming up here too. You know, and pain has gotten a really bad rap. Uh, you need to, uh, we need to explain that pain is put in our bodies for a reason. It's actually kept us alive as a species. The only two uh, places where we can be 100% pain-free would be anesthesia or being dead. There's a healing times guide where we could say the average healing time and uh, let the person understand that this is not supposed to be 100% pain-free. If you break your arm, you're going to be angry. You're going to be a little grouchy. You're going to probably uh, lose some sleep. You're going to feel these things as your body heals, your body is explaining to your brain, hey, you broke my arm, take it easy on the arm. This is put in place to keep us healthy. Uh, there's, a, there's one uh, medical condition where people do not feel any pain. And 
we felt them so uncomfortable with them, we put them in a little colony. It was a leprosy colony because they'd chew through their cheek or they'd uh, brush up against a tree and uh, get infected and uh, lose their arm to gangrene. So pain is put into our experience to help us. And people are getting a lot of misperceptions about pain and just like opioids. Opioids are a good tool for acute treatment, but they can't be, they're kind of, uh, uh, but when they're not helpful is when we get into the addiction and they're overused and they're used incorrectly and people are misusing them and we get the dependence into them. So we can't look at this as like black and white and if people can't look at this as like, you know what? Uh, yeah, I'm going to feel some pain, but as soon as they feel a little bit of discomfort, some people, maybe younger people, are more sensitive to feeling any kind of discomfort where that older person is like, ah, I'll have to put some butter on it. <laughs> Give me a beer. I'll, I'll work with her. <laughs> so it's communicating with uh, whoever that population is, letting them know, hey, pain is not, uh, not bad for you. It's actually it's a valuable signal. Yeah. Valuable, yeah. So looking at of all the psychological factors, uh, we know that uh, the single most consistent factor associated with pain is catastrophizing. And uh, uh, this is the survey I was talking to you about. The, uh, the, in, in 2017, they did a, a study, they took a look at their membership in practical pain management and found that 66% of the people that work in the field we're unfamiliar with the construct of pain catastrophizing. So we need to look at this. This is an important issue. Um, and this slide basically talks about defining that. It's you know an exaggerated negative orientation. Words like awful, um, pain, I'll be in this pain forever, I can't stand it. These are triggers. When you hear this, those words coming out of your patient, this is an example that their catastrophizing levels are going up. Um, and what we know, uh, it, it's uh, also excessive worry, rumination, people that just stay stuck on an idea, the inability to shift attention away from pain-related thoughts, um, negative expectations uh, based on previous memories of pain. So we get stuck in this kind of cognitive loop that have a lot of negative self-statements, feelings of helplessness, uh, and the inability to cope effectively would all be part of what catastrophizing looks like and you want to see if you can find this if this is going on that's what it is in your patients and we know that it's associated with uh, depression uh, poor managing pain and a lot of studies have really shown this um, so pain beliefs or, or, or people's beliefs about pain and disability are better predictors of disability than physician ratings of disease severity Again, I think this slide points to the power of how we interpret events and the, the importance of looking at what people are thinking about their own pain experience. So what can we do or what can it do? Um, CBT can actually change. They've done studies that shows that it changes the physical response in the brain. That may actually increase more endorphins in how we interpret the events. So it's a powerful uh, component of someone's pain experience and one we definitely should be looking at. Uh, it also reinforces the self-management approach. Rather than I'm the expert, you need to come to me for any pain relief. It is skills that you can develop. And I think that's an important, important point too. Um, CBT it can be used with other methods of pain management, massage, weight loss, physical therapy. It can be a component in the total package. Um, and I, I like this, CBT is almost always at least as good or better than other treatments. So, uh, and, and the negative side effects are, are pretty minimal uh, when you compare it to surgery and medications. Um, how does it help? Well, it encourages a problem-solving attitude. It's an empowering. It gets people kind of from that sense of, of helplessness, learned helplessness. I can do something. It does involve homework, so people need to kind of track their thoughts, and it's a, it's a pretty uh, uh, what do I want to say? It's an educational model. It encourages life skills. Um, and it also reinforces them doing stuff for themselves, which again moves them from that medical focus to more of a rehab model. Um, so there's a skill acquisition. There's an educational uh, uh, component uh, for the first phase. 
Um, it's ideas about learning different pain management uh, ideas. There's a skill part where you actually practice things and then a maintenance and re relapse prevention component. Uh, classic things, what is CBT? Well, it's number one, it's a self-management approach. Uh, it gets people moving. Uh, it teaches the concept of pacing uh, and using rest as, rest as a reward rather than uh, as, as a, a form of reinforcing inactivity. Uh, relaxation training skills, you can see some of these components of, of effective CBT. Uh, the thing here, this slide is I wanted to emphasize that it's a collaborative effort. Um, it, it's, uh, it's educative, but it's also, it's collaborative. Uh, each person has a, has a, plays a role, the, the person who needs to do things and then the educational component. Um, well, and, and as said, the last part of this slide says it, it, uh, it teaches you the benefit of remaining calm or at least neutral when faced with a difficulty. You know, otherwise you have the problem and then you have a second issue, which is being upset about the problem. So it's also been, CBT is based on rational thought, fact, not assumptions. Um, and it's the process really of maybe unlearning some, some things that we, we've fallen into a, a, a trap doing. You know, that's, that's really important because this takes effort. And a lot of times if somebody's trying something new yeah. and they're experimenting with it, doing their homework, it's, it's gonna be difficult. So when somebody comes back and says, yeah, I, I tried that, it didn't work. Yeah. We'll try it again. Yeah. Give or, it another shot. I, it's like playing any sport. Yeah. You don't get good at it right at the yeah. beginning. And it's not gonna work like a pill. It takes effort. Yeah. to get into this and to figure out where your mind is and what it's thinking about. And it's good that you tried. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. trying. Yeah, that's what <laughs> because we're, good. We're, we're looking for a different outcome. Yes. What we've had. Yeah. Okay, uh, critical elements, uh, relaxation exercises. You know, over the years um, that I've been doing this, one of the things that, uh, that I've, I've heard from people that um, have said that it made a difference um, I utilized uh, some biofeedback relaxation training, and that tool I found very helpful for a lot of the people that I've worked with with pain. Yeah. Because, uh, quite honestly, you know, the whole field of psychology and pain, many people are resistant. You know, it's, uh, it's not in my head, it's real. And the biofeedback tool was a nice way to redirect them, you know, to teach them some relaxation skills that, that they feel that, that, that reinforce the idea they can do this for themselves, but it's not as threatening as looking at their thoughts about pain. So um, biofeedback I found to be an extremely important element in terms of teaching relaxation skills. Um, again, we're running here a little bit short on time. That's what I mentioned. This is an example of biofeedback. I don't know that it's, uh, I don't uh, um, hear of a lot of other people utilizing it, but it's the one thing that people years later have said, wow, I, I go back to my biofeedback skills, what I learned about myself through that training. Uh, typical sessions range from, uh, you know, 10, 11 sessions from the rationale for treatment to progressive muscle relaxation to cognitive restructuring, stress management. I just wanted to give you an overview of what some CBT sessions typically look like. See, we deal with sleep, we deal with anger, increasing pleasant activities, important component. And uh, this slide, and I think you have access to all these slides uh, on the ECHO clinic, it just shows you the difference between the cognitive and the behavioral methods. Uh, I won't go into detail on that. Um, you know, the whole idea here is that we increase, helping people increase their sense that they have some control. The self-efficacy, a lot of the conviction that, you know, you can complete a course of action and get to a desired result. A lot of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is directed towards increasing the self-efficacy that they can make a difference. And there have been some really good studies that show that this helps. Um, okay, real briefly, historical perspective. Here's where we come early on uh, uh, when the focus was primarily behaviors. B.F. Skinner, first wave of this entire movement. Second wave came with Albert Ellis, kind of the rational emotive therapy. Uh, he began looking at just thoughts and, and the idea of changing the content of our thoughts to get to a better place. Well, the third wave now, as we're seeing it, uh, is exemplified by DBT. Uh, acceptance uh, uh, 
ACT therapy and EMDR work. And I put a picture of Steve Hayes, uh, who was a, a professor of mine up at the University of Nevada here, who was essentially the developer of ACT therapy and a lot of really good research that uh, reinforces this approach, this third wave. And if I could, I think I have a slide here which uh, talks about. So the second wave talks about uh, changing the content of your thoughts. Uh, reducing irrational non-productive thoughts and this works for some people okay it's a control based strategy you try to change your thinking related to uh, to more positive thoughts in your outlook the point I wanted to get at is this third wave kind of lets go of the idea of changing the content of your thoughts instead if I could summarize it without butchering the, the concept, it's the idea of co-acceptance, of, uh, of, of coexisting. You don't have to change that catastrophic thought, you just have to live with it and still do what you want to do is the key uh, issue there. And uh, again, a lot of mindfulness-based cognitive therapies, act acceptance therapies have shown that this has been very helpful with people with persistent pain. So um, the goals here are to, you know, again, control or accept pain, are not ends in themselves, and you learn to coexist rather than trying to get rid of it. So I have found having tools in both of these camps, the control-based strategies, kind of the, the second wave and the third wave of CBT therapy to be very, very helpful for people. And then they can kind of pick the one that works best for them. Yeah. Um, I, I throw this question up there, do personality factors influence pain? And uh, it, it, the research has really shown that there's no pain personality disorder per se. But what we do know is if you have a diagnosable personality access to disorder, uh, treatment is going to be much less effective perhaps and it's be more challenging. So personality and what they bring into uh, their pain, it certainly plays a role. So I just wanted to cite some evidence, uh, you know, uh, some controlled studies, meta-analysis, strong support for this approach helping people with physical pain. And finally I wanted to end up with the idea that the referral to someone in who does cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, some of the typical objections to seeing these folks there that I'm not crazy, you know, uh, you know, I've done this before. And one of the worst handoffs I ever got was uh, from a physician, this is many years ago, who said, you've got to go see the psychologist before I can continue your pain meds. So that made it kind of a difficult handoff to me. And I would recommend instead of maybe using the word psychologist or, or mental health, uh, the phrase behavioral medicine specialist has less kind of uh, negative associations. And what we essentially want to do is get that person to come to our office so we can introduce CBT strategies. And that phrase or that title uh, may help make that referral uh, happen. So um, we're kind of running out of time. Thank you guys very much for everything. We have a oh. question. Yes, Don? One more to the. Um to a, a therapist, do we request that they do CBT or do we assume that that's what they're going to do when we send them uh, that we're talking about pain management? Great question. Um, I do think, if, you know, some research behind who you're referring to, uh, you could simply ask that therapist, you know, what is your orientation? If they say it's Rogerian or if it's uh, psychoanalysis um, and you want somebody who does CBT, that's probably not the referral you want to make. Um, and most of us in the field will tell you what our background and training is and, and mention that we have been trained in cognitive behavioral techniques. So that would be the first step would be to say, you know, look at your referral sources and ask them what their orientation is. If they say CBT, it's a great, a great chance that that's what you're going to get. Okay. One more thing, uh, family. Is family involved in that? Because I know they, uh, this self-efficacy tends to get lost when family wants to try to control absolutely you know the family family plays a critical role in the reinforcement or criticism or punishment of pain behaviors I go back to Fordyce uh, they play a critical role in the patient's pain management in terms of how they react to the person's pain how they may inadvertently reinforce catastrophizing uh, and how they can positively reinforce wellness behaviors so yeah family is a critical component in uh, most all persistent pain patients live. Are they, I mean, are they active in the CBT component? Yes, you can find CBT therapists that will involve family members, yes. Okay. 
you, you know, family is so important. Uh, once a person, it, it depends on where they are in their uh, dependence or where they are in their healing process, because they're going to notice things completely different than the identified patient or the person who is uh, living this experience. And so getting their feedback and incorporating them, who, because they, can, they spend 24 hours a day with these people, right? We spend an hour with them, maybe a couple hours with them. You need to get all of the story, all the information. And just like Dr. Lewandowski was talking about, with building your team, you wanna make sure that you know what your patients are going to be exposed to. So when you communicate with that healthcare provider, you recognize, oh, this person's going to do a two-hour biopsychosocial evaluation. They're going to recognize everything that's going on with the family, with their environment, with their medical, with their uh, dependency issues. You're going to know everything that that person's going to go into. So when they get referred back to you, then you'll be on the same page and keep the trans the communication transparent with release of information and let the patient know we're all part of your team. You're the one who's going to be doing the work. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Patterson, who yeah. was here and uh, invite you to bring a case to our next echo so we can help discuss it with you and provide this interdisciplinary kind of a model and uh, become part of the team. We're here to help. So look, forward to, you. See, look forward to seeing you. I think we're two weeks yep. uh, out. And so um, have a great two weeks. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.